So we're gonna be talking today about a geological period that I think of all the geological periods may have the greatest consequence on our life today. And uh, so what we're gonna be doing is looking at this particular point in time. I have sort of a, a personal legacy that ties me to the Carboniferous. And it goes back to when I was a kid, when I was probably 10 or 11, somewhere in there, my father with a bunch of other folks, local people, bought a hunting camp in the mountains of Western Pennsylvania, in the Allegheny Mountains. And it was a bit more rustic than the one shown here, but it was a wonderful place to go as a kid to hike and hunt and fish. It was just, uh, just one of my favorite places in the world. And it, it's a, whoops. It was in the, the Allegheny Mountains, a beautiful countryside. And at that time, <clears throat> I was, interested in geology. I'd been collecting rocks for uh, years. And so my parents bought me books about geology to whet my interest. And uh, they talked about how the earth had changed and that just didn't resonate with me. I couldn't quite get a hold of the sense that there had been such vast changes in the character of the earth. And um, so one day I was walking along one of the trails and I looked down and there was a funny rock. A rock that I'm right now holding in my hand. And when I picked it up, I realized I had something that really didn't belong to this particular landscape. I didn't know what it was, but I was pretty sure it was part of a fossil plant. And my guess was it was a fossil palm tree. And that said that the world had definitely changed. It brought home to me how much variation there has been on this planet through geologic time. Whoops, that was a rock just falling on the floor. The, uh, <coughs> and uh, so I think that particular experience was it factored into my decision some years later to major in geology at Ohio State and, and the rest is kind of history. Then I got back to the Carboniferous again when I did my PhD dissertation on a Carboniferous limestone that cropped out around the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia. And that was sort of the last time I really worked on the, the Carboniferous. I had one other Carboniferous experience. It was, it was kind of funny. I took a field trip, participated in a field trip as a, as a, as a, a participant um, in Colorado looking at uh, some shallow marine Carboniferous deposits there. And we started off the very first day in a quarry that uh, was abandoned and uh, pretty much overgrown, but could still see lots of rocks. And we got there and the field trip leader, who was a friend of mine from the University of Indiana, said right off the bat, well, a year ago, Ed Clifton was in my office and I showed him several little samples from this quarry and I asked him what they were. And he glanced at them and said, oh, those are tidal deposits. So Ed, why don't you show us what it is about this quarry that makes it tidal? Well, talk about being put on the spot. I'd never seen these rocks before in my life. So I, I started to stall for time. I, I started talking about all of the things we might look for. And I got the group together in a, a spot where I could look out and sort of see the whole quarry and look at places, identify places that we could look to see if we could find some of these things. And sure enough, we went out then and we found them and my, my reputation was, uh, was still intact. But uh, I think that was probably the point at which I was most put on the spot since maybe I took my orals at Johns Hopkins or something like that. In any event, I haven't had much experience with the carbon for a sense but it has always remained one of, um, I think, 
the parts of the geologic record that I, I find most intriguing. So what is the Carboniferous? It is a period of time that extended between 300 and 360 million years uh, in the past. And uh, geologists divide time up into periods, each one with sort of its own flavor, its own set of organisms, its, its, its own character. And every one of these has contributed to our world today. Each one has in its own way manifested itself in our current environment, our current living. Some more than others. Probably the period that is most familiar to people today is the Jurassic, thanks to all the publicity it has had in recent years. So what does the, what's what are the legacies of the Jurassic period? Well, birds originated in the Jurassic and uh, that certainly is important in our modern world. But otherwise, not a whole lot. A book or movies. And that's pretty much the legacy of the Jurassic. On the other hand, the Carboniferous has numerous legacies that extend into our world today. And it's those that I'm going to be talking about the rest of this talk. It was a time of really dense, lush, vegetative growth, huge swamps and forests that existed, and some very strange animals that lived there. So what are the legacies of the Carboniferous? Well, it had a global climate that was most like our own, in the last 400 million years. So we can really identify our climate today or our world today with that of the Carboniferous. It was a remarkable period in the evolution of plants. We'll see some of those plants later on. And it is where we see our oldest identifiable ancestors in our particular line from primates to vertebrates, and um, it exacerbated an extinction event that opened the door to dinosaurs and mammals. And here we are. It fueled the Industrial Revolution and it shaped our modern world that way. And it contributes to a contemporary threat, the likes of which we've not seen. So you're invited to a field trip to the Carboniferous. I recommend that you bring rain gear and waterproof boots. It's gonna be pretty wet back there. And uh, oh yes, a, a really effective insect repellent might come in very handy. So what was the world like as we went into the Carboniferous? In the late Devonian, the period just before the Carboniferous, we had two continents, Laurasia and Gondwana. And they were moving together. Gondwana was creeping north towards Laurasia. By the middle of the Carboniferous, it is just about arrived. <clears throat> the two continents are starting to merge. There are lots of low lowlands and shallow marine um, areas that are opened up because of this. And then, and also at that time, North America and Western Europe are joined on the Laurasian continent, the rift that will be the mid-Atlantic rift that separates the two plates today hadn't yet developed. So North America and Western Europe are on the same continent and at about the same latitude, which becomes important a little bit later on. By the end of the Carboniferous, the two continents had really jammed into one another and where before there had been lots of swamps and, and uh, wetlands, there are now mountain ranges that are building. And it is a time of um, glacial development in Antarctica and a climate probably pretty close to the present day 
climate. So in the United States, in the early part of the um, Carboniferous, much of the country would have been covered by a shallow inland sea. And then as time progressed and we go into the latter part of the Carboniferous, we get extensive swamps building out into that sea. And if you remember this sample of mine, it came from approximately right there in the middle of these great swamps that were building out in the latter part of the, uh, of the Carboniferous. And because we have these, these two different types of, of deposition, marine deposition first, and then the non-marine deposition a lot after that, the North American Carboniferous is really divided into two periods. The Mississippian period, which is dominated by marine deposits, overlain by the Pennsylvanian period, which is overlain, which is consists of the non-marine deposits. Whereas the rest of the world keeps them lumped together in the Carboniferous period. And that's what we will do here. I won't break it into the Pennsylvanian and the Mississippian. So why the Carboniferous period? What makes it special? Well, it was a very lush green world that was dominated by plants. And this was kind of a first in the evolution of the earth. Back 500 million years ago, there were plants in the sea, but onshore, it was pretty much a bleak and barren landscape. But by the time we get into the Silurian and about 480 million years ago, we're starting to see plants creep out of the water and starting to colonize the land. To do that, they had to make a couple of evolutionary changes, a couple of hoops to jump through. And one of these was the development of a waterproof cover. Because if you are a plant and you don't have a waterproof cover, you're gonna dry out pretty fast if you leave the safety of the ocean or fresh water, what, whatever the, the, the water body you're in. So one of the things that the plants evolved, developed was this cover, very much like a sheet of plastic in, in many respects regards that retained the water inside the plant. But plants also have to breathe. They have to bring in carbon dioxide for their photosynthesis. And in order to do that, they had to have openings in that cuticle. And the openings were formed by what are called stomatas, little, little sets of cells that would fill with water and get distended. When they got distended, they would be open as they are in the upper, upper right. And then, or the upper left, I'm dyslectic. Um, and then they, when they wanted to close so that they didn't lose water, they'd release the water from those cells, they'd collapse and it would close up. And so that provided them with a mechanism for essentially breathing that was necessary, another, another step in their movement onto the land. And so some of the early ones probably look very much like modern day liverwort, um, a plant that is, is pretty primitive in its character. Well, so far the plants were really tied to bodies of water. They needed to have the water available uh, for their survival. And to get away from the water, they need to develop a vascular plant system, which means xylem and phloem. Uh, the xylem are essentially water mains. They're made of dead plant material. They're watertight. And so the water moves by capillary action through them throughout the entire plant. And then the phloem, 
on the other hand, are made of living cells and they're perforated where they join so that water can escape with the sugar that is provided by the leaves can be transported throughout the plant and, and it can in this way be fed. And once plants developed this vascular plant system, they could go anywhere where there was water in the soil. So this freed them completely from their bonds to upstanding bodies of water. This happened in the Devonian before the Carboniferous. And uh, it was at that time we got the first trees and the first forests. So we get into the Carboniferous and what's happening is these continents are starting to move together. They're starting to merge. And so there are lots of low wet areas in a zone that is typically pretty wet between the Tropic of Capricorn and Tropic of Cancer, I think, but I'd have to check on that. But I think that's what it is. Anyway, 30 degrees north and south of the equator is a wet zone. And this is where our Carboniferous deposits are accumulating in things that are probably much like this peat swamp in Barneo. So a Carboniferous swamp might look like this. Um, lots of strange vegetation and uh, some real peculiar forests with some strange, strange trees. This is a tree that grew up 150 to 100, up to 150 feet tall, Calamites. Um, it was hollow on the inside. It was bamboo-like uh, in its trunk and its stems. It was a wetland tree that formed in the low wet areas. And you might see a similarity with its modern day counterpart. Although some of them looked a bit different, they're still the same general kind of structure. And we see it today, you probably all have seen this, horsetail rushes or equisetums. These are the living relatives of those great trees of the Carboniferous. There's another tree called Archaeopteris, which is really kind of confusing, confusing because Archaeopteryx was a very early fossil bird. So this is a tree and a tall tree, but if you look at the leaves in the upper left-hand corner, you see their leaves are very much like ferns. And these were just giant fern trees. Then there were the scale trees, so called because their barks looked scaly. And there were two of these that were particularly prominent. One of them is Lepidendron. Lepidendron could form really tall trees and notice the, on the left-hand side, the things that look like pine cones hanging down. Those are not pine cones. This is not a pine. They're spore cases. And they grew out on the ends of those branches as sort of the last bit of growth on a branch would be a spore case. And so the tree would grow, produce the spore cases, and then couldn't grow anymore, and that was the end of its life. So they would reproduce once at the end of the life, it could get up to 100 feet tall. Another scale tree that was related to them, and you can sort of see why they were called scale trees in this artist's rendition, the Sigillaria. Sigillaria was a similar tree, sort of hollow stumped, um, Sometimes you can find casts of the almost the entire tree, as in this example from Great Britain. And it had a strange root system because the things that look like roots here aren't really roots, they're really branches that are branching out below the surface of the ground. And the roots are attached to these little rootlets that fasten on it to one of these little spots 
is a place where one of these rootlets attached. And if that looks kind of familiar, well, yeah, there it is. So what I've got here is the cast of a root of a Sigillaria or a Lepidendron. They're both pretty much the same in their root structure. And so I'm seeing the roots of a fossil extinct tree. So these were the scale trees. They were, they were a major component of the Carboniferous forest. And today they're represented, their, their family is still around, but they're quill warts and quill warts I'd never heard of before, but they are aquatic plants or semi-aquatic plants that live in the, the cooler climates of the, of the world. That's what's left of the scale trees today. The rainforest provided space and food for a lot of animals that were developing. Amphibians first came ashore, first developed in the preceding period and during the Devonian. And basically fish got into shallow water and eventually developed lungs to help them breathe and use their fins to move about in the very shallow water and these became feet. And so we had the first quadrupeds, which are these Devonian amphibians. But the amphibians are still tied to the water and they're tied to the water because their eggs don't have a protective shell. They're just a membrane. And if they're not in the water, they dry out and the, uh, the embryonic forms are lost. So in the Carboniferous, very likely, the amphibians were laying their eggs in shallower, in the shallowest water they could get away with because that would be the safest from marine or freshwater predators that lived in the water, fish particularly, that would feed on the eggs. And eventually the eggs got to the point where they started to have a case that was not breakable, was not permeable. It was something that could be taken with the water in it and carried away from the water. So a little reptile could develop inside an egg, even though the egg were completely out of the water because it carried the water with it and sealed it. And so this broke the bond then of the reptiles or allowed the reptiles to develop, broke the bond that the amphibians had with the water and allowed reptiles to move away and to actually occupy the Earth's surface. This is the earliest confirmed, a, a reconstruction of the earliest confirmed reptile, about 312 million years, which is getting toward the late uh, Carboniferous about eight to 10 inches long would not look particularly out of place in a, in a forest today. This is a little reptile that is the oldest known diapsid reptile. Diapsid, what does that mean? And why is it important? Vertebrates come with essentially three different types of skulls, depending upon the number of openings besides the eye socket and the nostril. The anapsids have no additional holes. And today they're represented by the turtles and there are no unequivocal Carboniferous forms. They may have been there, but they haven't found them yet. The diapsids have two holes in the skull and they're represented today by birds, snakes, crocodiles, and lizards, and also were represented by the dinosaurs. The synapsids have a single hole and today this is representative of all the mammals, including us, we're all synapsids. And synapsid reptiles first appear in the latter part of the Carboniferous. So in terms of taking our ancestry back through geologic time, 
our particular type of skull can be found in these animals. So they, one of them or something like them, was the base of the family tree that eventually includes the mammals and us. So these earliest known synapsids appear toward the end of the Carboniferous, but very important. They're also, they had to contend with some big amphibians. Uriops was the biggest, about six feet long or so, and a mouthful of big teeth. This was an animal that probably fed primarily on fish, although it probably would have snapped up a little uh, reptile if one got in its way. It had a pretty nasty set of teeth. So it was, it was the, the prime predator of the day, big amphibian. Now, one of the characteristics of the Carboniferous is the atmosphere was different from the atmosphere at almost any other time in the Earth's history. The oxygen levels were as high as possibly 35% compared today with our 21% that we have. And this is probably a consequence of the immense amount of plant growth that had developed. <clears throat> Plants photosynthesize, taking energy from the sun and carbon dioxide and water, and um, using the energy of the sun, they photosynthesize, and as a part of the process, they make molecule of sugar and they release oxygen. So photosynthesis releases oxygen. And um, so carbon dioxide is pulled into the plants, oxygen is released. And so that's what's going on with these great forests. They're bringing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and they are releasing oxygen. Sometimes you see someone say that they pulled the carbon dioxide out and thereby increased the oxygen. And that's not really true because Today, carbon dioxide is about four hundredths of a percent of the atmosphere, oxygen about 21%. You could pull all the carbon dioxide today out of the atmosphere, it wouldn't really affect the amount of oxygen we have. But the plants were also not only taking carbon dioxide out, they were putting oxygen back into the atmosphere. Today, there seems to be a fairly good balance between the amount of oxygen that is released by photosynthesis and the amount that is consumed by respiration by both the plants and the animals. And this is true both for the non-marine, the terrestrial environment, as well as the marine environment. And uh, <clears throat> so, that respiration, part of it is plants, but also part of it is animals. Well, in the Carboniferous, we have an awful lot of plants and we don't have that many animals. There's not that much that will draw the oxygen out of the atmosphere that's being produced by photosynthesis. And so as a result, we have this oxygen level it's about 35% of the atmosphere compared with the 21% that we have today. And this allowed for some rather remarkable insects. This is a fossil dragonfly and it's about 30 inches across, it's two and a half feet. That is one big bug. And the dragonflies weren't the only big things. Cockroaches have been found that were also quite big. I don't know how many of you have had the experience of turning on the light and seeing cockroaches scuttle off the kitchen floor headed for the dark corners. But we spent several years living in Houston in the 90s and yes, this is something we did see on occasion. I can only imagine the horror 
that one would feel if you turned on the light and cockroaches the size of bedroom slippers were scuttling about the floor. Good Lord, don't even think about that. And then, wait, those look like tire tracks in Carboniferous Rock. What do we have is, is this evidence of ancient aliens that visited the earth? Well, actually no, although the organism that produced them is about as alien as you can get. It was a giant millipede or centipede-like animal. And these things were up to eight feet long and several feet across. If I saw one of these in the backyard, I don't think I've got enough bug spray in the house or anywhere else to deal with it. They're pretty formidable. So why did the insects get this big? Well, insect respiration, breathing, they don't have lungs. They don't pump the air through. The air just circulates through. It goes through little holes in their side called spiracles, and then it enters tubes called trachea that get smaller and smaller and finally diffuse out into the insect's body. So it's just a simple diffusion of air from the atmosphere through these, this tube system. And the tube system is, is pretty small. So if the bug gets bigger and the tube system stays the same size, it's not gonna get enough oxygen to support it. But in a world where there is a lot of excess oxygen already in the atmosphere, it allows the insects to get big. And that's probably the primary reason we see these really giant insects in the Carboniferous. So a big change from our world of today, a lot more oxygen then. I'm not sure how dangerous that level of oxygen would be to us today. Oxygen is toxic and um, we'd probably adapt to 35% oxygen but I know that when I was an aquanaut years ago, one of the great concerns was keeping the oxygen level down at a level that uh, we weren't getting too much oxygen in our breathing because it could cause all kinds of problems. <clears throat> one of the features of the, the geological features of the Carboniferous rock is something geologists call cyclothems. And cyclothems are cycles, a repeated cycle of rock type in the, the sediment. And this would be a fairly typical one. It starts at the bottom with a marine mudstone that passes upwards into a sandstone that formed on a shoreline. And sitting on top of that, some non-marine muddy sandstones, maybe some freshwater limestone, mudstone above that, then coal. And sitting directly on the coal is marine mudstone that eventually might pass to marine limestones up further up section and then back to marine mudstone and then upwards into a shoreline sandstone, a cycle that's repeated in the rocks. And so what we're really seeing in terms of the environment is a shallowing of the sea until we get shoreline deposits. And then the shoreline deposits pass into non-marine. And from the non-marine, we end up with a, a swamp where coal is produced. And then the sea comes in over the top of that and continues to deepen until finally it starts to shallow. And then we start generating the cycle all over again. And let me back up one. You'll note that we have this change from the non-marine swamp jumps into marine deposits immediately at the top. And I think this is fairly typical of shorelines that are retreating. For example, this is the East Coast and uh, the sea is encroaching. We, there's not 
that much sand that's available to the system because it's being trapped in the rivers. So without sand getting out into the marine environment, the bit of sand that you've got is pushed by the waves up into beaches and barrier islands. And then as sea level rises, these just move shoreward. Well, behind those beaches are marshes. And this is where the coal would form. And then the barrier island sands would move right on across over the top of that. And you'd start getting marine muds deposited on top of those old coal deposits. So that is the character of a cyclothem, a pattern of, of shallowing and uh, going from marine to non-marine, back and forth and back and forth. And it isn't just Carboniferous rocks that show this. Um, this kind of pattern I, I have found basically in shallow open coast deposits all around the world. And it is a very common signature, but it's particularly common and well-developed in the Carboniferous. So this is the pattern shallowing, then non-marine, then the coal, marine incursion over the top of that that gets deeper, and then shallowing back up again. So it's a change, you could call it a change in sea level in a sense. Well, those of you who sat through the, the talk on uh, that I gave earlier, on climate through time, we talked a bit about Milinkovitch cycles, these cycles that are caused by variations in the Earth's orbit or the tilt of its spin axis. And um, we noted that there was a real profound link between particularly this eccentricity curve and the episodes of glaciation shown here in blue and interglaciation, interglaciation shown in brown, but there's a seems to be a real consistent pattern to that in our recent past. In fact, a part of the world we're probably still part of with this pattern, we just happen to be stuck at the top of one of these things. Now, there's no reason to think that that pattern is not going to continue as it has in the past. This is a fairly recent study about five years ago that was looking at observed cycles in the rocks, which are shown here in red, and predicted Milinkovitch cycles, which are shown with the dashed blue line. And again, there is a pretty remarkable correspondence between what they found. It looks like these Milinkovitch cycles that have dominated our Pleistocene world were also there dominating some of the Carboniferous world as well. Which takes us to another subject, and that is the origin of coal. Because we had these immense swamps where trees, plants were dying, getting buried in the water, and they were not decomposing. Today, wood that gets into the water, there are bacteria and their fungi that consume the wood, and basically, it, it doesn't really form coal today. But things like this fungus hadn't evolved yet. This came in probably about another 100 million years later. And um, it then would decompose the wood. But in the Carboniferous, there's really not much that de decomposes that wood. So all that carbon that is carried down into these swamps is preserved in the form of peat, which is probably everybody's familiar with it from garden work. Um, just a black, heavy soil. Most of the peat today comes from mosses that uh, hadn't yet evolved in the Carboniferous. So all of the peat from the Carboniferous was from these woody plants that had died and decayed in these swamps. And this was in a zone that was um, Today, it would be considered between the 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And basically, what we have here, North America, we have Europe, China, 
all forming within this zone where you might call it the peat zone. So lots of carbon being sequestered into the sediment. And that carbon in the form of peat, when it's put under heat and pressure, is converted to coal. And it goes through a phase early on of lignite. Lignite is brownish, it will burn, but lots of impurities, a lot of water still within it. It's not a very efficient fuel. But if it gets compressed a bit more and uh, put under pressure, a little bit of temperature, it creates common coal, bituminous coal. And if you take a coal and put it under a lot of pressure to the point that you're making a metamorphic rock out of it, you get a rock that's nearly pure carbon, anthracite, sort of the, the, the prime coal of, 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 of them all. <coughs> and uh, if you took this anthracite and put it under a whole lot more pressure, get something else. So if you can figure out a cheap way to convert coal into diamonds, let me know. Well, how it was done, how it was converted to anthracite and, and the, the better quality coal essentially came from the mountain building and the compression and the pressures that were divided as those two continents mashed together in the latter part of the Carboniferous and later. Coal has been utilized for centuries. The Romans used coal. And one of the early uses in China was as a carving material. It was kind of cool. In Great Britain, there are exposed Carboniferous rocks and that are exposed at the surface and are just below the surface covered by younger rocks. Um, quite a bit of it. And you can see there's a real correspondence between the outcrops of Carboniferous rocks and the coal fields of Great Britain. Great Britain had a lot of Carboniferous coal. And so it was not an accident that it was really the first nation to move into the industrial world with the Industrial Revolution. The early coal mines were not a really healthy place to be. And one of the strangest things about some of them is that they are very, very low, designed specifically for children to move the coal out. I've seen this in Spain, and it was, it was heartbreaking, quite honestly, to see this little three foot at it going off and that kids would have to go in and, uh, and work to bring the coal out. Coal mines commonly flooded because they were hollow and, and low, so water would seep them out. And so that was a constant problem with these British coal fields. And so the first steam engines were developed in order to get the water out of the mines. That was their primary function. But once you develop a steam engine, fuel it with coal, you've got something that can do all kinds of things in terms of manufacture. And this is the origins of the Industrial Revolution that began probably in the 16, maybe late 1700s in, in England and uh, carried on into the, the early 1800s. One of the consequences was a railroad, trains that ran on coal. In this country, in 1830, there were 23 miles of railway. By 1850, there were more than 9,000 railway miles and they were growing fast. And notice that most of them are up in the Northern States. And this is a reflection, I think, of the fact that we have lots of carboniferous coal, high quality coal, that is in this part 
of the country and was fueling the industry and the industrial revolution that was occurring within the United States following that in Great Britain. Was the American Civil War a legacy of the Carboniferous? Well, I suspect my historian friends would probably tell me I should stick to rocks, but I look at that map at the distribution Carboniferous coal, high quality coal. And you see it's mostly in the Northern states and the proximity of that coal to industry, to, to the development of industry. And then with the industry population centers, the North developed an industrial base that was quite different than the South, which didn't have that much coal, didn't have that much industry, and remained pretty much an agrarian society with an economy that was fueled by cotton and slave labor. And so, I don't know, maybe the Carboniferous did have an impact on the division of the American Civil War, the division of North and South. So I don't know if we didn't have the Industrial Revolution, whether we would have a city like this. I'm guessing there would be a city, but I suspect that without the Industrial Revolution, that's largely based on Carboniferous coal, it wouldn't look like this. As we get to the end of the Carboniferous, the swamps are disappearing. And the carbon that has been taken out of the atmosphere by the plants is starting, it's having an effect, it's chilling effect. And so we're seeing a collapse of the rainforest in the late Carboniferous. And with that, we have some extinctions and we move from the Carboniferous into the succeeding period the Permian. The Permian is a time that's a world dominated by large lizards like these sailback lizards. If you haven't ever had a plastic dinosaur set, I'm sure you've seen these lizards uh, in them. They're not dinosaurs. They're actually a synapsid reptile, which means they are members of the mammalian family tree. They are the descendants of those synapsid reptiles that developed in the late Carboniferous. Some of them may have been hairy, but they still laid eggs. They were still, they were still reptiles. The Permian had two significant extinctions, both caused probably, certainly associated in time with flood basalts, major outpourings of lava on the surface of the earth. And the second one of these at 250 million years is called the Great Dying. And it was the greatest extinction event in the history of the earth. 96% of the marine species died and 70% of the land species major, major catastrophe, I'm greater than anything else we have seen. So why that particular severity? Well, we have had a number of basalt eruptions like that at the time, and they caused extinctions, but nothing like that. Why was this one so much difference? Why the great death of the marine Organ, organisms? And the answer is that in Siberia, where this eruption occurred, there were thick coal seams, probably not too different from this one in Montana. And when lava comes through that, volcanic action comes through that, it burns that coal. 
This is a paper that uh, just came out this year, but looking at volcanic ash from those eruptions, they find lots of little pieces of coal, really documenting the fact that the coal was there and there in abundance and the burning of it probably dumped a huge amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And that carbon dioxide would cause an acidification of the ocean, probably greater than anything we have seen, which can account for this tremendous die off in the oceans. And um, that particular event set the stage then. The big diapsid lizards are gone. There's still um, diapsid reptiles around. The circle is around one there looking at the two little dinosaurs that have just appeared on the scene around 230 million years ago. But that little reptile, by another 20 million years or so, may well be producing its offspring producing or being the first mammals. So carbon infrared deposits fueled the industrial revolution. And today, they may carry on as a threat to our way of life. Coal emits more carbon dioxide per amount of uh, energy release than any of the other fuels. So it's particularly, I wouldn't call it dirty, it's just very rich in carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide, as we noticed and noted in the other talks that, that I gave, is clearly linked to temperature in this, this ice core from Antarctic. The red line above shows the inferred temperatures from oxygen isotope data. And the curve down below the blue one shows carbon dioxide levels as indicated from bubbles within the ice. And there's a real solid comparison between the two. And Carbon dioxide has been going up, and as carbon dioxide has been going up in our modern world, so has the global temperature. Again, looking like there's a very distinct connection between carbon dioxide and temperature. Coal production has almost doubled in this century so far. And uh, the consumption has gone up equally, basically in Asia. Europe has declined a bit. North America is just about the same through this period of time. But Asia, coal has become the major fuel, it looks like. And <clears throat> this putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and warming the atmosphere has one effect that I want to sort of focus on because I think it's, it's one of the most immediate and scary effects of burning all that coal that I can think of. We've heard a lot about storms this year. There have been a bunch of them, including one magnitude five at the very end in the Gulf of Mexico. And the big deal with these kinds of hurricanes and, and typhoons is not so much the wind that's associated with the rise in water level. It's carried by the storm of basically bringing water into the shore and flooding the coastal areas with a lot of water in a relatively short period of time. You see that in New Orleans, 2005, prime example of what can happen. There is a clear cut link, I think, between the water temperature in the ocean and the power of tropical storms. And I think you could see that pretty clearly from this graph that shows storm power and sea surface temperatures over a series of decades starting in 1950. And I'm talking now about the storms that form in the tropics, the hurricanes, the typhoons, cyclones, whatever you call them in the Pacific. And this source says that 
since 1979, okay, look at the strongest hurricanes or typhoons, and this is several years ago, of the seven, five of them formed in this last decade. And this is a diagram that I've made just looking at the number of magnitude five hurricanes through the period of time from 1920 to 2020, the last hundred years. And in the first 80 years, we had 13 magnitude five hurricanes. Since 2000, in the last 20 years, we've had an additional 13. There doesn't seem to be much question that we are getting more big storms today than we had in the past. And this almost certainly relates to the warming of the oceans. So in the US, there we got problems. Flooding from high tides has doubled in just 30 years. These are essentially storm floods. New York City, 50% of it's at risk. And the plans are, it's gonna take about $4 billion to protect the city, which is a lot of money. And Miami may not be protectable in a any kind of an economic sense. Um, there are some that suggest the city is just going to have to be abandoned. And this is probably true of New Orleans as well. But the place where <coughs> I have the biggest concern is actually in Asia. In Asia, they have something that they call the LECZ, the Low Elevation Coastal Zone. This is the land that's lower than about 30 feet above sea level or 10 meters above sea level. And a huge number of people live in that zone, hundreds of millions of people in that zone, many of them already on deltas that are subsiding, that are also that contributes to the problem even more. And they are particularly vulnerable to large typhoons. And these can just be absolutely devastating in their flooding effects. And the floods really are what take the toll on humans. The number of deaths, hundreds of thousands of people died. And it looks like to me that we've got a recipe for horrible disasters. Um, take, you want the recipe? It's one global sea level rise, which is not very high, um, and you add that to actively subsiding highly populated sea coasts and mix in more violent storms due to warmer water and add a handful of devastating storm surges. And I think you can't get around the fact that this century is going to see some really serious rearrangement, especially in Asia, the coastal population centers. Um, very much an ill-wanted legacy of the Carboniferous. But there is a silvery lining of sorts, and that is there's still a lot of coal available and we may someday find a way to utilize it without this great problem with the carbon dioxide. And it's kind of money in the bank. It's, it's maybe we'll never have to use it, but Sometime in the distant future, that may pull us through some crisis or another. And so with that, I wish you all a wonderful holiday season. Stay safe. <laughs>